So I want to talk about growing your personal design heuristics. And you might ask, what interested me in this journey about heuristics? So long ago, in the last millennium, 1990, right, I wrote this book, Designing Object-Oriented Software, and that was before uh, we even knew how to draw objects. Some people drew them as fluffy clouds, and other people, well, you know, we had little boxes, but there was no standard way of doing it. Um, anyway, I wrote this book with my uh, co colleagues and coworkers, Brian and Lauren, and a few years after I wrote the book, I got this email from an instructor at a company in California that shall not be named, um, who basically said, I really like the way of thinking about objects, but I think I'm a failure. What am I doing wrong? I can't get my students to exactly reproduce the design that you have for an ATM in your book when I teach them. And I was horrified. <laughs> we had a sort of a toy example of a design for an ATM. And his expectations as a, as a successful instructor was everyone should create the same design. All right. As an author, I know that nothing ever exactly goes by the book. It doesn't. You ask me to design something on Wednesday. Today is Thursday. I will do something different. So how many of you have heard of the of Blue Apron? Anybody heard of Blue Apron? A few people. So I got, just to illustrate um, that nothing goes by the book, I got for Christmas present two years ago a gift subscription to Blue Apron. And they send you all the ingredients and the recipes, and it's all measured out in the right amount. And then you're supposed to just cook and enjoy it. So this is a, the very first recipe I cooked, Zatar roasted broccoli salad with eggs on top. And here's my picture of what we did, you know, what I cooked, all right? Looks pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, I was proud of it, so I took a photo of it. But anyway, if you look at the in, uh, instructions for the recipe, it's fascinating. It's very illuminating why nothing goes by the book. First of all, you notice that some of the instructions are absolutely precisely cook your eggs for nine minutes, right? And some of them are kind of dodgy. Well, I'm supposed to then take those eggs and rinse them for 30 seconds to one minute. So that gives me some tolerances there. And then the next, when I'm roasting the broccoli, I'm supposed to put a drizzle of oil over. How much is a drizzle, do you know? Oh. Um, and then, you know, I can uh, cook it for 20 to 22 minutes or until, so it's giving me like or conditions to check. And as much of the garlic paste as you'd like. Now, if you like garlic, you don't know how strong their garlic paste is. You don't make the paste, you just put, you know, press it out of a tube. Anyway, so it's giving you all this instructions and to, to top it off, many, many places in their recipe they ask you to season with salt and pepper to taste. If I had followed that instruction, it would have been inedible. <laughs> so anyway, there's no substitute for learning from your own experience and personal reflection. So when I look at design advice or design practices, um, you enrich it every time you build something. So let's talk about heuristics because I believe, and this whole talk is about how you can grow, nurture, cultivate, and share your heuristics with others. So uh, let's start out with the definition of heuristic. Some people talk about it as being a practical method. Another way is a rule of thumb, something that I generally apply uh, most of the time, or a useful shortcut is another common definition for the word heuristic. I don't particularly like that one. Or another one being approximation, and I don't like that one either. So Wikipedia says, and they have to be right, right? It's any approach to problem solving, learning, 
So it's not just solving a problem, learning or discovery that it employs something that's practical, but it's not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect. Great definition. Now, let's get on to heuristics. And before I talk about heuristics and show you examples of both heuristics in the wild and techniques for cultivating your heuristics, I want to talk about this book that inspired me. My friend Eric Simmons from Intel, formerly of Intel, throws me books every once in a while and says, read them, and I want to see what, what happens. So um, this book is by uh, Billy Von Cohn. He's a retired professor of nuclear physics and used to build nuclear reactors. Um, his thesis is that everything we do is a heuristic. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed to work all the time. Now, as software designers and developers and architects, we know that. Um, so I'm going to use his definition. Anything that provides a plausible, you know, reasonable direction in making forward progress towards a solution, but we can't justify it. We just have to go by feel based on our, our practical experience that we've grown up over time. Now we can be taught things. And um, so here's some general engineering heuristics that Billy talks about in his book that just illustrate um, some engineering heuristics that he found nuclear engineers and other engineering type people do. Solve problems by successive approximation. Um, so I kind of work towards uh, my answer. He also says, given a certain time constraint, if you're asked to give an answer, you should be prepared to give one, right? So if you're rushed and hurried, you might not give such a good answer as you are if you had more time to figure something out. And so his other heuristic that he talked about was always giving yourself a chance to retreat. Now, I think a lot of these kind of match up with what I've been hearing at the conference uh, and what I've learned through agile practices and good engineering practices. And the other one, he says, use feedback to stable, stabilize your design. So those are just some general engineering heuristics that are sort of driving a lot of us in the way we work. Um, you might think that heuristics are just these pithy little small phrases. But I think that there's a lot more behind any simple phrase. So if you talk to someone who's an expert, they'll boil it down to something. But usually, and this is where your personal experience comes into play, well, do this unless, until, and sometimes maybe it works this way. There's a lot more wisdom behind any pithy phrase. So simple phrases are just one form of heuristic, but there's usually a lot more when you dig into it. Patterns are another nicely packaged form. By the way, we are still writing patterns. I wish more people would read them. Um, but uh, software patterns are another form of heuristic. And they're particularly handy because they explain the context where the pattern author found it to be useful. So in which situations can I use the pattern? And they give you kind of a sketch for a general solution. So von Kuhn talks about three different types of heuristics. And I want you to think about these and be aware of them. Heuristics that solve a particular design problem. Whether I'm designing a meal, whether I'm designing an organization, whether I'm designing my software system. So if you read long ago this classic book by Martin Fowler, The Three Approaches for Structuring a Domain Layer, he had three different patterns there based on the complexity of the problem. And there were really three heuristics that you were competing with each other. You know, how should I structure my application? So if I had a simple application uh, where I was pretty much scraping stuff off the screen and dumping it into a relational database, just, just 
write transaction scripts and talk directly to the database. No need to structure your application any more than that. If I had um, uh, a complex existing set of data in a relational database, he said, and I wanted to apply logic to multiple roles, in the data, I might use a table module or an active record if you're using the sort of frameworks, those ancient frameworks of the early 2000s. People are still using them. Uh, and if I liked uh, to, if I accepted the overhead of um, mapping to and from an, uh, a relational database, again, this is dated technology, but that's the, the, the pattern. I use this uh, domain model pattern where I would map the objects into and out of the database and have them operate on behaviors. So those are three approaches. How many of you are familiar with those? How many of you are still writing systems that have that? A few, okay. Not everybody. So there are solvable problems and that might be my problem. And really, just to illustrate, you know, the domain model heuristic covers a class of problems that it could still work with. So could the table module heuristic. And also this transaction script, but it was supposed to be for wussy little applications, so I don't think about that very much. Um, but what happens when I'm sorting through and trying to figure out an approach or what to do next whatever level this heuristic is, is that my preferred go-to heuristics are the ones that come to mind first, right? And for me, you know, when I was an old object geek, I've been doing functional programming a little bit lately, um, but I, I would prefer putting a lot of behavior into my rich domain model. And you say, well, okay, those are heuristics that were good back in the day. Um, these still existed, you could ask Martin Fowler, what about CQRS? What about microservices? What do you do? What do you do with those old patterns? You know, and uh, my advice to you is it's really not fair to consider um, an older system or its designers, if they're older designers, based on today's best heuristics that you know how to apply. So you really should be respecting the design heuristics of the systems and coming to understand them as you're applying, you know, adding new functionality. Um, so our state of the art, however, is constantly progressing. So we do need to uh, incorporate and modify our heuristics based on our learning and our understanding over time. So pattern authors, write about what they know and what they have seen that works generally for them. And when we're, in, when we're in our writing workshops for patterns, we don't say, oh, if you have never done this, it's not really a pattern. So, so we only write about what we know, our go-to heuristics that we have found work in certain cases. But back in the day, even in, in the day, there are other alternative um, ways of structuring an application, enterprise application. Stored procedures, anybody use that technique? Oh, quite a few hands, actually. Good for you, it was fun. Um, my, uh, yeah, my uh, biggest stored procedure that I ever looked at had 100 arguments to it. I was like, oh my god. Anyway, I didn't write it, I was just reviewing it. Um, and, and rules engines was another approach for structuring the behavior of a system. And there are, you could look at and compare and contrast. There's best fit pro profiles that you might come up with for when I might wanna choose one architecture style over another. Um, but there's always gonna be disagreement because experts don't agree. There are competing heuristics and they jostle around and you and your team, when you work on things, have to come to some kind of working agreement. So there are also heuristics that guide our use of other heuristics or, and I gotta say this word, meta heuristics, one of my favorite words, meta, all right. Um, and heuristics that guide our other heuristics are basically saying when we're approaching a problem, 
we want to um, <clears throat> structure what to do, kind of like have a higher, higher order plan that's sort of guiding what we're doing next. And then there are little details. So let me give you an example. Uh, Jason, how many of you went to Jason's talk this morning? All right, he had a heuris heuristics for, s for splitting teams. Um, and he had a three-step process for splitting teams uh, that he talked about. Wait for seams to appear. Uh, this is when he's growing an organization, when there's clunky communications or awkward meetings, and after that gets a little too uncomfortable, try to nudge things apart by having separate events or different meetings for smaller sets of people. And then finally, once people are kind of working that way, just say, oh, now we've split the teams. And everybody goes, oh, great. Um, so what is the meta heuristic there? For him, it was deliberate culture. I don't want to just let culture happen. I want to nudge it along. That's the meta heuristic that was guiding this kind of behavior. Jason doesn't know that I put him into the talk, but I, I took his, the photo of this this morning and, and, and did it. And I thought, I wanted to show an example of that kind of guiding heuristic. Now, another kind of meta heuristic example is there's this book. Um, it's about re-engineering software systems. And it's object-oriented re-engineering patterns. If they'd struck the title object-oriented out of it, it would be a, a bestseller, because it has some really good advice. Each chapter in the book is a set of patterns related to problems that you may have. So if I'm coming in and I'm trying to get a first contact with a, with a system, I'm going to talk with experts and developers and then verify what I hear. And then maybe one of the patterns is, if I verify what I hear, I could read all the code in one hour. Now you know you're not really going to read all the code in one hour, but you're going to get the highlights. Now, another one of those patterns is skim the documentation. These days, maybe there would be no documentation, so maybe that's a pattern that's sort of not a heuristic that isn't useful anymore. But let's, what are the meta heuristics here? First of all, I'm going to talk with developers as a way of understanding the contact, you know, my, get my first contact with a system. I'm also going to talk with end users in order to get the first contact start here. But another heuristic is, after I've done this, I need to verify what I hear. That's what I'm going to do, and it's going to guide me to um, use these other patterns. So that's an example of patterns that guide you, or heuristics that guide you to other, other heuristics. Now, there are also heuristics that determine our attitude and behavior. And they're, they're, they are around us all the time. Um, the heuristics that I may choose to do to make forward progress are a matter of the context, the values, the fit, and my preference. And so just to give you a silly example, um, when I go shopping and there's two non-nerds, the first one who suggests which item to buy, they'll say, oh, okay, sure. Uh, you get a non-nerd and a nerd, and the nerd will suggest that something might be a better deal. The non-nerd will go along, right? Okay. And um, if you get two nerds together, um, they might be debating a long time, and two hours later, they realize that they don't understand a clear definition of value. All right. Um, so that's a silly example, but if you look at things like the Agile Manifesto or the Manifesto for Software Craftsmanship, they express um, explicit value-driven heuristics too. It's not enough to just have working software. I want to make sure that it's crafted well. It's not, a, not enough to respond to change, but I want to add value while I'm doing that. And I, I thought about this, and I said, well, what are some of my personal um, heuristics, these sort of go-to value-driven heuristics? And I realized that one that has driven me for a long time is I value consistency over cleverness. Um, and, and, and so I don't always go to the shiny new uh, toys that are there, but I like shiny new toys. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little, little later. 
But anyway, that's just one of drives my behavior. So when we have code reviews or we're looking at design choices, if it's too tricky um, uh, and clever, and it's only done because it was cool to do it, I'm not so keen about that. So here's uh, a thing. Heuristics need to be challenged. And you're gonna learn a lot. You're gonna grow your uh, understanding and learn some new heuristics if you challenge them. Um, so you need to challenge your existing heuristics, become more aware of them, it'd be a first step, and, and challenge them with new, when you get new ideas, and other design guidelines or rules of thumb that you encounter, you should always question them. So I don't know uh, how many of you are dealing with this problem, but let's talk about how do I sort things out. How many of you are doing microservices, all right? Okay, so how big should a microservice be? What are you, yeah? Oh, he said, okay. Anybody else? Micro, tiny, 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 okay. Size of an object, okay. All right, we have three experts here. Let's see what the other experts said. Um, Sam Newman, who wrote the first book on it, says small enough and no smaller. Hmm. Now, I'm gonna say that isn't a good heuristic. Sam's a really smart guy, but he was hedging it there. Because a heuristic should be able to guide you to some action. How can I act on this? So there's some other advice that people have said. Um, ben Morris, he's a guy who blogs. He says, no bigger than a bounded context and no smaller than an aggregate. So for those of you who know about domain-driven design, this might make sense to you. A bounded context is roughly uh, uh, something where all the work flow that's going on, the concepts that you're manipulating, the events you're generating are all using the same language. A customer means the same thing. Um, and an aggregate is one of the things that's a primary uh, object, if you will, that's operated on, or an entity. Okay, so he gives you a range, right? How big is a bounded context? As big as it needs to be. Oh well, let's 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 not get into that. Okay, now St Stephen Tilkoff says, well, he he kind of punts uh, this and he says, well, I'd end up with a dozen, maybe twenty or thirty services, or self-contained systems, as I prefer to call them. For any, but but he says, what's really you're asking the wrong question. Any given interaction should trigger, triggered by some outside event, you should only have three to five path hops through this. Okay, all right. Okay, that's what Stefan says. Um, and Udi Dahan, he's someone known in the domain-driven design community. He says there should be only a single service impacted by a change to the definition of data. And then he says, well, so I have big blobby things that may be between seven and 15 services the majority of the time. Now Michael Feathers has said, well, the two person team, two pizza team, whatever. So when you hear other experts, and we heard three other opinions here, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you have to sort this out. Particularly if this is something new and you're just experimenting, you might feel confused. Um, if you know domain driven design concepts, you might suspect that as a first cut, start with something bigger than bust it up if you follow some people's strategy, split it up as you add, find the need, don't start with tiny. And then you heard other people I'm saying, start tiny and then grow big, all right. Heuristics and experts often disagree. Heuristics often conflict with each other. Do you ever have arguments on your team about design, anybody? <laughs> okay. All right, competing heuristics give us options. And there's more than one way to architect or design a system. Each of these heuristics can make sense under certain circumstances. And if you don't have the same conditions, the specific advice might not be useful. Even if you have um, a, 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 a well-gelled team, you still will have differences of opinion. So you have to kind of decide on something and, and move forward. And what uh, Billy Von Kuhn says, what do you do? 
as a designer, you use the judgment, use your judgment, choose the heuristic or, uh, you know, that you find resonates with your context, um, or put your unique spin on it because you realize that we're kind of different here, that's okay. Try it, see it, see if it makes forward progress, then adjust, you know, back up, give yourself a chance to re retreat. Now I wanna end this talk with some advice, specific concrete actions that you can take for actively cultivating your own heuristics and then sharing them with your mates. If you can learn how to articulate your heuristics, um, you will learn from each other. You'll become more intentional about what you're doing. So I'm interested in way too many things. But I suggest that if you want to learn a new area of technology, that you map out your interests. For me, there's a lot of things. Microservice architectures, there's many corners of that to go into. Um, design heuristics for functional programming. I'm an object programmer that's trying to understand why everyone's excited about functional programming. Um, event sourcing architectures, there's, there's design nudging. How do I change a design without disrupting it? Um, these are things that I'm all interested in. And then I pick a place to start. In the last year or so, I've been working on systems and have, have the opportunity to understand functional programming day to day, what are we doing, what's new about it, what's different, and learning a lot about event sourcing architectures and event structures and event stores and things like that. So if you map out your interests, then what do you do? Um, one thing that I like is sort of a heuristic swap. You might share and compare your preferred go-to heuristics with people. If you go to a meetup, uh, if you have a, a, a discussion at work, sit around um, and have a conversation. Now here's a conversation that uh, two world-class experts in domain-driven design had at a workshop that I gave on how do they get people to care about modeling. So they were, they were talking on a whiteboard. That's really great. Each one of those are probably a, a wealth of heuristics there. How do I get them in? How do I get them nudged to keep working on the uh, modeling? They, they were talking, it was great. So if you want to do more than just talk about it, um, one of the things that you can do you know, is, is quickly re record your heuristics, sort of the gist of it, on, on sticky notes. Sticky notes are my friend, uh, so maybe we can talk about our go-to heuristics, our things that work about how do I do microservices, I want to lazily implement them, Maybe I start with a, a, a way to get pathways to a system when I'm first building it. You know, there's heuristics for trusted and untrusted events we talked about. Uh, you know, some modeling gotchas, how do I avoid design and modeling gotchas. So this is all in a one day workshop we did uh, at the Main Driven Design Conference. Now, you can always say more. You know, just putting pithy little phrases on, on, on sticky notes isn't enough. And uh, one technique that I've found pretty useful is to use an index card and actually write down three parts. What, what am I doing? You know, what's the question that I'm trying to answer? Um, what's the answer to that question? And then some examples to jog my memory. And, and, and going to this conference, I've been doing some of that too. Um, so here's an example of the question and the answer is, when should I generate a different event uh, from a business process, if I'm using event uh, source kind of architectures? And uh, the answer is, if I have different actors involved, uh, even if it was the same event, uh, even if the system is in the same state, I should probably generate a different uh, event just because there might be different downstream behaviors. So if I have a car accident reported by uh, the renter of the car, that's different than one reported by the agent who notes the ding on the car when it's returned versus the telemetry of the car reporting that event. Okay, so that's a card. And I could do another one, well, how many events should I generate? Um, uh, if there are different behaviors downstream, do it. So anyway, you can see that. Now what do I do with this kind of stuff? I turn the question and answer into a heuristic by making a statement that sort of 
melds the two together. So here's the way, here's what that one was. Create different events for a business process if different downstream processes react differently. Probably too many difference in that, but that was my first cut. It's okay. Um, now, if I really like this heuristic, if it's something I really want others to know, this is just my personal, uh, but if I, I want to collect these, here's our practices that we kind of like. I might turn it into something like I, I would call a heuristic gist, where I give it a name, I summarize the problem, I summarize the solution for that. Guess what? This is becoming almost like a pattern, isn't it? But it's not that heavyweight. Um, so that's just something to do is like record heuristics after a conversation. Another good way to grow your heuristics chops is to take something that you wouldn't normally do and argue for that. I don't know if you ever, and argue against it too, but you're gonna be easy to argue against it, but you'll learn something in that process. Um, so some approach or some practical method that you don't like, argue for it. Why would you do this? All right, so here's an example from Paul Graham, Revenge of the Nerds. He writes about, well, really, um, the more demanding an application, the more leverage you get from using a powerful language. But many things are simple. So most programming probably consists of little glue code. And for little glue programs, you can't. You can use any language that you're already familiar with. And good libraries just get it done. So his heuristic from that is, is basically, if you boil it down, is it doesn't matter what programming language you use if you have a simple program, right? Use the best tool and things that you're familiar with to get it done. Reasonable heuristic, right? But now I find myself arguing, and that, that's this, just get it done, move on to other things. Now, I, I kind of say, well, you could start out with a simple application, but what happens when it gets uh, complicated um, and you have rich behavior that you didn't know was there? And you could use transaction scripts if stuff isn't going to change much. But what turns out to often be little glue programs grow into big monolithic glue programs that really are sucky and hard to maintain. But I realized when I got down to this debate with Paul that my lifelong heuristic is I like to learn something new. So <clears throat> there's a compete. I don't want to always do the same things the same way with what I know how to do. That's kind of soul sucking and boring. Um, so when I realize that, there are really two competing heuristics here. The one to just get it done and the one to take, if there's something new, take the opportunity to try something. It's a low risk situation. Try something new with, with a low risk, simple, approach. So those are kind of competing heuristics. You learn a lot if you really spend a lot more time arguing that other position than I did. But, but Paul's right. Most of the time, um, maybe I should be <clears throat> not just learning things that are new. So another way to grow your heuristics is to have a conversation with someone else a one-on-one -on -one conversation about a specific topic. Now, it might be that you're the expert and someone else is picking your brain, but maybe it's someone who knows more about a topic that you want to know about. So come and find speakers who are giving tech talks and have a structured conversation and see what their real heuristics are. I invite you to do that. So here's an example of when I talked to Matthias, when I was first learning about event source architectures, I started out and we spent two hours. I said, well, I met him at a conference and I said, well, I want to learn more about this. What are your heuristics? And I said, well, what's the heuristic when you model events? What do you do? And he says, well, events are, should be records of things that have happened and already happened, not things that will happen in the future. So that's how you should name them. He went on and on about that. So a reservation has been made or a service has been scheduled. Be sure to make it about what has actually happened in the real world. Um, another heuristic he shared was that bounded context should keep internal details private. 
but they are generating these event records that are consumed by, by processes outside the bounded context. Um, so what do you do? Um, and so he gave an example. And if you have a structured conversation with someone about a topic, make sure they give you examples. Don't have them just wave their hands. So an example he gave was, if I have extra precision inside the bounded context, and I, I don't really want to pass out 10 digits precision because two digit precision in monetary units is enough for the downstream consumers. So I have to understand the workflow. I have to design that. And I go, well, I said, maybe there's another heuristic. He says, don't design messages or other events for specific subscribers. So it's a bad thing to design the standard format of two-digit precision for monetary units in a business transaction. And another process needs four digits precision, and one needs 10. You know, don't, don't do all three of those. I went, hmm. He also said, agreed upon standard formats based on standard usage. And there again, when I wanted to dig deeper, I, got, I felt like a two-year-old asking this kind of question. I said, well, what happens if a new process needs extra precision, right? You want to push on those edge cases, because that's where you learn we're experts, if they, if they really are experts or they're faking it. Um, but anyway, he said, maybe it belongs within the bounded context. So his first go-to heuristic was, if something needs more precision, it's probably because, uh, you know, investigate first whether it should fit within the same workflow because then we won't be violating our rules. And I said, well, what if it doesn't? OK, so we went on and on. But the point is that there are heuristics that are competing, and those are where you find design tensions. Um, don't lose necessary precision is a heuristic that was underlining all of this. Standard formats, don't reveal private information, all these things as a designer are kind of like competing against each other, and you're going to have to make interesting choices. So that's, that's just the way it is. Um, so as I said, distill what you hear at conferences. So <laughs> this is a, uh, a DDD Europe conference slide. And right there on the slide were five different approaches for patching uh, a supposedly immutable event store when your schema changes. <laughs> okay, and, and Michael Overeem was talking about, he had been surveying different people about what they'd done. And really, these are different approaches. In order to turn them into heuristics, you need to know uh, when is the appropriate context for having weak schemas where you can like tack on more stuff. Uh, what happens when you run an upcast? What's OK if one of the approaches is just patch, rewrite, and go GDPR, hmm, I wonder how that works. <laughs> is that OK to do that? Um, and then there are some, that's the in place option. Uh, and then there's the splice and rewrite as you go. You know, there's, there's all these different approaches. And he had found that everybody was, you know, was doing multiple ones. So there's a lot of different contexts there to dig out. Now, sometimes, and here's, here's another example, um, is uh, Esther Derby conference I was at last year. She was talking about experimentation. And uh, she threw around an acronym. And I realized I needed, if I'm going to understand uh, the heuristics behind it, I needed to remember what fine was. So it wasn't enough just to take a photo on the, on the slide, because she never really said that. Um, but I, had, I, I went up and asked her. Now she's written a book about it. But f make your experiments with fast feedback, inexpensive, no permission required, and easy was her heuristics for a good experiment. So anyway, um, so you distill what you may hear. And I'm going to say, here's another radical idea. Take notes about how you really are working, how you and your colleagues actually work rather than what you think you're doing. <laughs> uh, I was impressed by 
Artie's talk before because she's saying measure your WTF right, factor. Uh, what you might find what you're actually doing versus what you think you're doing could really surprise you. And you're, you notice that you're behaving quite differently than what you say that you're doing. Um, so I've been inspired by this book, uh, Writing Ethnographic Field Notes. Ethnography is much more than just interviewing people about what's important, but it's inferring what we're concerned about by observing and noting the ways that we talk and act in natural settings. So when you're working on a problem, uh, when you're working on something new, uh, as I attempt something new, when I have a half hour, I tend to write, I, I've been writing field notes, I've been practicing. Well, what am I really learning when I'm working with other people doing design and implementation work? So here's just some notes that I took uh, after, a, after, not during, I was present working. Uh, uh, when I spent some time mobbing with the remote, uh, remote mobbing, so that, was, that was a lot of fun with the cucumber folks, the people who do BDD. So there's a bunch of notes. We, we did it in the summertime, so in the US, I'd wake up at 6 in the morning, and it was 4.30 at night, or 4.30 in the afternoon, their time. And so we'd spend two and a half hours, or it was like 3.30 their time. We'd spend two and a half hours, and I'd be happy and go on with the rest of my day, and they'd be done with their work. And we were working on some uh, building a framework and just doing bug fixing. And I was hanging out with them, observing, because I wanted to learn more about functional programming approaches and design. So here's some notes. These are, these are my notes, raw, unedited. You will observe that I kind of noted heuristics there. Um, and in their mobbing practices, they, um, this is again behavior, it's who goes next as the driver, because we're all remote mobbing, is the person who has the most to learn. And, but they actually said the stupidest person goes next was, was their heuristic. Um, another one was, and this is a heuristic that I didn't turn into a heuristic, was to make the smallest move possible while keeping most of the tests passing, what I noticed that was the general approach was that we'd pass in extra scaffolding code, leaving, you know, leaving the, the code that was working there, but adding in extra parameters that we would like pe uh, peel off and then use. So we kind of kept stuff that wasn't used as we were patching it in and trying stuff out. Um, so we were keeping the code and the API the same while making small incremental changes by adding stuff in. Now that, to me initially I thought that seemed like a lot of work, but it kept everything working and if it failed you could roll back. So that was, that was what, we, what we did. Um, and this is a simple one again, just when something was incomplete uh, and not thorough about the test code, we added whips so we, we, could, uh, we could know when we were like fudging it. Um, and then, uh, just in the conversation, Matt was talking, Matt Wynn was talking, he said, well, we lear we've learned to not name tests for the event. Uh, and I said, well, there's a heuristic here, but I, I didn't bother digging into it. So that's just an example of, uh, I think I had like two pages of notes from a two and a half hour uh, programming session. So I also encourage you to distill uh, what you do as you're doing it. Uh, get comfortable journaling um, on what you value and what your heuristics are your go-to ones. Um, personal ethnography, if you will. And I'm going to say, I've noticed, you know, what are your general guidelines? Um, what are your go-to heuristics? You might want to spend 15 minutes, and here's some things I always like to do. Um, and I've found that, personally, that writing things down by hand is quite different than just typing them up. So having a handwritten actually forces your brain to be more intentional about what you're doing. Finally, I want to say, distill what you decide. So if you've had a debate and you've taken an approach, even you know, as we know, this design approach isn't exactly always guaranteed, is to document the sort of decisions that you make along the way. But don't make this into a big, huge effort, small teams can do this. There's a, a, a Git project, um, Michael Nygaard originally wrote 
a, a blog post back in 2011 about documenting architecture decisions. It's really design decisions. It doesn't really matter. Uh, design architecture. Uh, but this, this, there's this format that he has, but the Git project has several different templates for this. And you can easily make your, your templates. The point about this is, is if you've made some choice and put it in, you check it in with your code. And so it's there. Now, we all know that some decisions stand for uh, a long time, and they sort of become the backbones of our architecture, the heuristics that are there, that are last. But there are things that, that then are proposed or deprecated or su superseded. And, and I liked uh, Michael's template in, in particular because I can change my mind. Well, we superseded it by this. So I, I encourage you to look into you know, that approach if you want to become more intentional about it. Finally, 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 notice what happens when you apply a heuristic. Right? So I'm choosing something consciously. Um, what was the effect of that? What happens when I back up? Be aware that there are always other options. And when you disagree on what to do next. Disagreement doesn't have to be you know, confrontational. There may be some underlying values that are different about w approaches or different perceptions about um, the impact of things. And so, um, you know, if, if we have this mode of communicating and experimenting and being more intentional, let's just become aware of our differences and try, try things together. So I encourage you to grow your heuristics, keep them alive by being more intentional. Start thinking about what they are. If nothing else, you can ex if you can explain your reasons for doing something to someone who's junior or new to your team, that's really great. Write them and start sharing them with others. Um, and expect them you know, to grow and evolve. So thank you. <laughs>